best package CD of the year, Kevin. Look at this cool. It's got this wooden box here. got all this cool stuff in it. This is the best package CD I've ever seen. Oh, it's fantastic. It's very cool. It's got, like, three little toys. <laughs> and cool music. It'll be re released on uh, May 20th. Look at that. Woo! 3D. Please welcome the Smashing Pumpkin! Welcome to episode 60 of the Hipsters United podcast. My name is Chris, and joining me this week are Jason. Hello. Jill. Hi. And Andrew. Hello. It's been a couple of weeks since our last podcast, and I wanted to get us together to talk about the, the news of the past few weeks. Um, we touched on it briefly in our last show, but the Pumpkins appeared on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno two weeks ago to perform Widow Wake My Mind. And the song was slightly rearranged for the performance with the sing-along Oh, Oh, Oh part removed from the beginning. And this was Mike Burns' first television appearance with the band, but the talk of the show afterwards was the backing choir of Linda Strawberry's family, who flew in from Utah to sing backup vocals. Jill, I've been thinking about what the purpose of this whole thing was. I mean, you could hardly hear them in the broadcast, and this is a role that Linda herself has performed in the past. She was playing keyboards during the performance, so I think she probably could have easily also been mic'd and sung backup vocals while she was playing keyboard. But Billy had to have known that they would garner a lot of attention from the snarky internet rather about this uh, choir rather than the song itself. Uh, do you think this was some sort of calculated move to get some extra attention, or what was, what was the point of having the, the, the choir of backup singers there? Well, it was probably to divert attention from the fact that Jay Leno talked there for another 20 seconds about what a nice package the Smashing Pumpkins have. <laughs> So maybe it was the only comedic relief to that entire Leno episode. Oh, they put dye in his hair, though. Oh, it was so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I was a little bit rude in my tweeting um, before the show started, or, you know, before the pumpkins came on, because, gosh, it was such a drag to get through that episode. But anyway... Um, Back to your actual question. I think it was, I mean, I think the decision to include the quote children's choir, which turned out to be not so children y, <laughs> um, was, I think it was legitimate and I think it was a choice that he was trying to make honestly and um, quaintly, humbly. I don't know. It, 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 I, I kind of disagree that you couldn't hear them in the mix. Um, I definitely heard a few things that were not entirely in tune but <laughs> I, I, I and and the little girls were totally adorable but i just don't i just didn't really understand it if we ignored the choir i thought the performance was really great actually um i thought they seemed like they were having a good time they weren't super tight but they you know seemed seemed to be energetic and mark too and like cracked me up i mean what was that? What was that getup he had on? The top hat, jeans, and <laughs> <Yeah>. sneakers. <laughs> it was like somewhere between like Willy Wonka and Slash or something. <laughs> I'm not really sure, um, but <laughs> I mean, it was. I thought it was. I, I think Slash was owns the copyright on top hats for, uh, <laughs> <laughs> for guitar-ish themed uh, instrument players. <laughs> Yeah, someone commented in our in our thread about that that uh, the the band didn't have costumes on. It's so unusual to see, especially Billy, but the Pumpkins in general play a concert where they're wearing street clothes. Well, Roy Thomas Baker did tweet at Billy that he liked the artful Dodger look. Yes. So, um, I guess Roy thought it was a costume <laughs> with the scarf and the the hat and the tilted baseball hat. Yeah. I don't know if that's really a, co a costume, though, since that seems to be Billy's uh, general artistic choice these days for what he wears. <laughs> He's all about the scarves indoors. Well, could you imagine? I mean, the song itself lends it, it lends the tone to subdued street cred, I suppose. I mean, could you imagine them coming out on stage with the, like, white cape and make that <laughs> white headdress thing that this, they wore on the 20th anniversary tour. That's all I can imagine. I, I haven't seen them <laughs> dress normally in years. <laughs> so, well, I don't you, know. 
You didn't go out to see Spirits in the Sky? No, I didn't. Uh, you know, Billy, you know, is, uh, I think he wears the costumes whenever he uh, can, so to speak. But, I mean, in different settings, he's smart enough to scale back. Yeah. I mean, when, when, he, when the Pumpkins toured Europe uh, at, the, at the very start of the revival in 2007, you know, he was wearing not only the, the stripe, I don't know, whatever the heck he was wearing, white from head to toe and the stripes on his arms or whatever, but he also had this sort of, like, gauzy white thing <laughs> draped over him, too, some sort of, like, massive dress or something, but, you know, once he got to the U.S., he wasn't wearing that. <laughs> and uh, whenever they were, they never appeared like that on TV. Uh, yeah. Not in the U.S., so, I mean, he's smart enough to scale it back and have a children's choir perform. Yeah, I'm still a little annoyed at uh, my, my, my good friend who texted me the tip from inside the taping. Oh, there's a children's choir. And then I watch it later, and it's just like a family. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of quite grown. <laughs> yeah, there were two children. <laughs> so, so I hear I'd posted, yeah, children's choir. Yeah, and like two out of the nine people singing, or however many there were, were kids. I felt stupid. Oh, well. Did- what did you think, Chris? I mean, you were kind of asking me a, a little bit of a leading question. Yeah, I, mean, I definitely thought it was odd. It actually reminded me of like a 1970s variety show look. It, it was, I don't know, I don't, I don't think it really added anything to the song, because I, I couldn't really hear. I heard there was a male voice that I could kind of hear mm-hmm. during some of the, the backup parts, but besides that, I couldn't really hear much of what they were doing, and they were kind of distracting, just in their out of placidness, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, given that I think the effect on most people, including sounds like you guys and me, is kind of a WTF effect. <laughs> <laughs> um, that you know, okay, let's go ahead and presume that was the goal. <laughs> you know, the goal was to create a what, like, just sort of subvert expectations about what a Smashing Pumpkins performance is going to be. You know. And I think it was also a gesture of trying to involve Linda Strawberry's family in it. I'm not sure exactly what the purpose of that gesture is besides just being, I mean, inspiring that WTF and maybe being kind about it. But it seems like they all, I mean, from what Linda and Billy and I think there were a couple other, maybe Carrie as well, tweeted, um, they all had a really good time and enjoyed the day. I think Linda even tweeted extensively about it the day after, later that evening. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I definitely agree with that, that it was kind of like, hey, let's have Linda's family on, you know? Yeah. I mean, so, that, yeah, I agree. On one level, there's just kind of the nice, like, inclusion aspect of it. Let's give Linda's family a trip to L.A. and put them on TV. Um, but, you know. Well, I think it was, I, it's I a risk. I don't know that you can go through Billy Corgan's career and find a lot of, hey, let's just include people's families. I mean, you can at several moments, but mm-hmm. being on national TV is a big moment. Yeah. So I, I just, you know, it, it, it seems to me like kind of a, a way to be more emphatic about, like I said, subverting expectations, you know? I mean, the image of the Smashing Pumpkins is like some kind of goth band that's going to come out there and play some sort of quasi yeah. song, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, it certainly lends a wholesome image to the whole ordeal. Well, last <laughs> time they were on Leno, they they did. They dressed in black dresses and played Cash Car Star. Yeah, right. So, I mean, I I think, if nothing else, I think that seems, that would be my guess, and it's only a guess as to what Billy was aiming for, which is just some sort of, like, you think you know what we are, you don't know. You know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, and he had to know that people would be talking about it. Like, one way to get people to get get your video extra views afterwards online is to have something out of the ordinary and unique that would cause uh, websites to blog about it. Which I think they, he completely failed at. I mean, in my looking around, I didn't see much coverage of it at all. Yeah, I mean, um, it didn't really have much... It didn't have much legs. It sure didn't seem even like looking at... Twitter searches at the time, it sure didn't seem like many people at all tuned in or cared to say anything about, you know, the band. So. I think that may have been the venue in the first place. I mean, oh, a lot of the 
Unless you were specifically watching Leno for the pumpkins. I don't, I don't okay. think many of the online uh, tastemakers just accidentally caught the end of Leno. Yeah, <laughs> nobody wants to watch that show. No, <laughs> especially no one wants to admit watching to it, <laughs> or admit to watching it. God, it was so bad. Yeah. <laughs> it you was know, painful to fast-forward through it on the uh, TiVo-like device. Yeah, I mean, obviously... Um, if people have read the entire history of Hipsters United, they might, you know, characterize our general viewpoint as sort of like, I don't know, <laughs> I'm trying to think of how to describe it, but like, skeptical of skeptics, <laughs> like an, alter- an alternative to the alternative or something. Um, but, you know, <laughs> given the, you know, and so then you might think, well, the, the kind of alt slash hipster consensus is that Leno is terrible. Leno is terrible. Oh, he's so unfunny. It is just hideously bad. Yeah. It is just terrible. It's a well-deserved reputation. Oh, yeah. And And this is... And and I'm not... Jill is a huge Conan fan, which I'm letting... No, no. A couple seconds, but I'm not... I don't really care that much about Conan. So, like, I don't have this, like, bitterness at Jay Leno for getting Conan off the air, but Jay Leno's just not funny anymore. Yeah. It's like, he just, part he's of the problem... To be funny not, that, not that I'm going to get into this, necessarily, because this is one debate that's been raging on for quite a while now, but I used to like Jay Leno back, I don't know, prior to his going to primetime, um, and probably a f- few years ago. Like, I don't think he's that... He, he's not that egregiously bad, or he didn't used to be. But ever since he came back from prime time, his writers, I just think, are terrible. I think it's just, I don't know, it's its awful. He's like the epitome of, you know, brainless, late-night parent entertainment. Yeah, yeah. Like, well, I, can can just, I mean, my parents watch it, but my mom, I'm sure, like, sleeps through most of it with her mouth hanging open. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't there even a sketch with his writers in the sketch during the? I episode? think so. Yeah, it, it was totally not funny, and they weren't funny. It was just oh, it was horrible. So, Jill, in the last podcast, you predicted that you would get a frenzied email or call from your mom saying that the pumpkins <laughs> were wrong. on Leno. Did you get that call? <laughs> I was wrong. <laughs> she must have fallen asleep. Yeah. I know. I'm sure they were probably about when it's probably uh, such a bad episode that they just couldn't even stay awake. About when Leno was getting the dye put in his hair, and yeah. most of the audience fell asleep. Although I will, I will have one diversion at the end of the episode. Oh my gosh, is Heidi Klum really like almost as tall as Billy Corgan? That's crazy. She's a tall lady. Yeah, <laughs> couldn't it have been the heels? I mean, yeah, she was wearing crazy heels, but still. <laughs> You know, um, what, this week, like, this week, like, after the Pumpkins were on Leno, Hole was on Letterman, and I'm, I'm kind of a Letterman fanboy a bit, um, so, man, and I tweeted something like, watching Letterman waiting for Hole is, like, infinitely better than watching Leno waiting for the Pumpkins. (laughs) Nobody else is gonna agree. Letterman, he's almost as bad. Well, one quasi-Pumpkins-related note is, (laughs) uh, after seeing... That performance and then the online video of the Record Store Day performance, is, it, it's really reminded me how great it is having Jeff back in the band, and I, I'm really glad that he's in the studio right now with Billy. We've gotten some some Twitter pictures from, from Carrie of Jeff in the studio, but it's nice having old Jeff back. Can, can, I, can, I, can I be a jerk for a second? And I mean, like, Jeff seems cool to me, but I mean, this the, the whole, like, oh, Jeff! thing. I mean, it strikes me in the same way that, like, why people love James Eha and Darcy for all those years. Like, oh, James, oh, Darcy. Like, why? Like, I just don't get it. I mean, they seem like nice people, but we don't really know much about Jeff. Um, Jeff never really talks. Like, why we have this, like, strong... I mean, he seems cool. He seems like a chill bro. But, like, why we... <laughs> people, like, latch on to these um, very secondary figures in the band, and they, like like make such a you know like oh yay jeff and so i'm just i'm i'm curious now chris that you've expressed this and i'm you know kind of i'm and i'm not like against it jeff seems cool to me too but like you know to me ultimately obviously the band is about billy and 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 and, you know 
I just think Jeff's Lark, guitar Lark playing was, really was about Jimmy to some extent, you know. Yeah, I mean, I I think Jeff's guitar funny. playing is a good counterpoint to Billy's. I think having that, having him playing second guitar, I mean, not not to say that there couldn't be someone else coming in and playing bat, bit, playing second guitar that wouldn't be just as good, but. I like having him over there. I mean, he does look like a chill bro. I don't think he's... I, I agree that there's often this kind of pedestal. People put up the other band members on a pedestal, especially when they don't talk very much. Or, in the case of James, every once in a while they pop in with a, an odd joke. And, and legitimately funny jokes. I mean, I don't want... I'm not trying to... I just, you know... Why are you trying to start shit, Jason? It just kind of reminds me of like people who... You know, they liked the Chicago Bulls, but it's like, my favorite player is Horace Grant, or something, you know? It's like... Steve Kerr, man! It's like, <laughs> he really? The, he <laughs> missed the glue. <laughs> You're just mad because James is is working on his solo album again. He's going to prove Billy wrong when Billy said, what is James doing music-wise lately? Ooh, mm, snap. <laughs> Assuming James finishes that solo album, which he's been working on for many, many years. But it's halfway done in his head, Chris. Yeah. He's got an official website now. Yes, indeed. Yeah, but I, I, back to your point, Jason, I, I think it's pretty common that the people kind of latch on to the other band members because they they like listening to the music, but Billy comes out and says things that they don't necessarily agree with. So, Yeah, Billy is not relatable. Yeah. At all. Billy like, Billy's can, can be a tough guy to be a, a fan of with his... Attitude and things he says, yeah, exactly. So well, I, th- I think people can imagine themselves in the role of Jeff, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think people can imagine like what it's like to be Billy or something. Yeah. Nor should they. Well, at the risk of turning this into a tabloid show, we should probably talk a little bit about the Twitter feud between Billy and Courtney Love from this past week. Uh, to recap, everything would take too long, and I really don't want to do so. But I guess the highlights are that. Billy helped Courtney with some songs for the new Hole record that just recently got released, and then later didn't give her permission to release the songs, because I guess they got in some sort of argument. But she did anyway, and then went on Howard Stern and did some other interview where she alluded to a threesome that she had with Billy in the 90s, and then Billy fired back at her on Twitter for not writing her own songs and for her lax parenting skills. Kerry Brown and his wife were somehow involved, and it was a big, ugly mess. And, oh, by the way, it was probably also good publicity for the new whole record. But the upshot of all this is that, once again, Billy goes after somebody he used to have a relationship with in a public forum, be it a romantic relationship or a musical relationship, or in this case, I guess, both. And, once again, he comes across as, I don't know, petty, vindictive, a little, uh, a little crazy. And, Jason, I guess my question is, is why? Why does Billy continue to snipe at former acquaintances online? Yet, <laughs> from a fan perspective, uh, he won't give us a single update about what he's working on. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm going to kind of refuse to answer your question. And I actually don't, and I'm going to kind of go on a, a mild rant, but I really don't, <laughs> everyone... <laughs> Everyone wants to understand why, but I think trying to understand why is nearly impossible, you know? Um, and there have been a, a, a massive spate, there has been a massive spate of news and blog articles about this uh, this Twitter war or whatever, and a lot of these articles will, like, presume to tell you why Billy Corgan is mad, you know? And... Uh, you, and basically most of them have said something like, well, it's because Courtney Love stole his songs for the whole album or something. And I'm, I'm just sitting there like, you know, we, you, you have no idea if that's why, you know? I mean, there's probably something about that that's part of it. I mean, clearly that didn't make him happy. But, you know, there's all sorts of other stuff that Courtney said lately. I mean, there have been several interviews where she's said something about Billy lately. And some of them have been very unflattering. Like, there was one where she, really recently, where she basically said that, you know, his last few albums haven't been any good, <laughs> you know, and but nobody's daughter is getting really well-received or something, you know. Well, thinking what I think of Billy, like, his music is the thing he cares about the most, and that would have 
that might have pissed him off more than the rest of it put together, but I don't really know that that's true. But, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Chris, why do you think he's, why do you think he did it? I don't know. I don't know why he continues to say this stuff in public, you know? Like, whatever happened between them obviously did not happen in public. It happened behind closed doors somewhere, and we'll never know the extent of their relationship and what what caused it to go south most recently. But it just, again, it paints Billy in a bad light. Like, he goes out there on Twitter and, like, fires off message after message about, like... Here's fact one about why you suck. Here's fact two about why you suck. And even if they're completely legitimate and completely true, it just makes him look bad. And at this stage of his career, he has to know that. So either he's so angry that he can't control himself, or, I don't know, he's just not familiar with the concept of communication on the internet. Well, remember, she's, like I said... This week, I mean, it seems to be glossed over in some of the coverage because people, people like, not people, but the news media writing up the story seem to love the Twitter angle, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. And, like, the fact that w- what he said to her was through Twitter. But what I'm kind of saying is there were also these several interviews that she gave, like to the NME, in the week leading up, and, and one to Howard Stern, I believe, where she talked a lot about Billy and said negative things. And I think... You know, in large part, the Twitter, the tweets that Billy made were in response to those interview comments. But those interview comments were like basically not written about when people wrote about when media people wrote about Billy's Twitter thing. So what I'm saying, why I'm saying that, Chris, is I think you know if you want to ask why he's making a public volley of tweets at Courtney, it probably has to do with her making public statements about him in these interviews, right? And I think maybe he's botched. Maybe he botched the the way in which he went about responding to her because he didn't contextualize it, you know? He didn't say, okay, Courtney just said this in this interview, and now I'm saying this in response. So people didn't get it. It just, you know, for whatever reason, it's been characterized as like... I mean, I've literally seen several articles characterize it as Billy Corgan gets mad and that the last thing that Courtney Love had done was apologize to him via Facebook. Right. You know? As if nothing had happened in the interim, which is total bullshit. <laughs> was it the Facebook apology for something else? Like, it was... Or was yeah, there a that, more recent Facebook apology? You know, and and, even, and the coverage of her Facebook apology, the same thing. It didn't, like... Usually that coverage omitted major things that had gone on between them. You know? So I'm not saying it's... This complaint is not a complaint about bias. It's, it's not a complaint about people supporting Corgan or Love. Actually, it seems like lots of the media has been supportive of Billy in, in this uh, recent, like, thing. It's just that, Although, like, it's just there's this massive pretense of, of these media types pretending to understand the flow of what's going on. And, and these are people, you got to understand, the people who write these news articles, they, it's their job to write news articles, and they go from writing one article to the next during their work day, you know? And this one article they wrote about Billy Corgan and Courtney Love was like the stuff they worked on between 10.15 and 10.40 a.m. on their Wednesday, you know? So they spent like 15 minutes like doing a couple of like clicking around the web trying to figure out what was going on. And then they dashed off some story that they hoped would bring in some search revenue, you know, some search traffic and some ad revenue. And that's where all these stories come from. There isn't some sort of d- deep research and understanding of the Billy Corgan Courtney Love relationship going on. And it's just like a bunch of crap. And that's why you see these just stupid like accounts of it going on that you know purport to tell you why what's happening is happening, but it's just it's this big. Never show. mind that most of what Courtney Love says on the internet is totally un- like unintelligible, <laughs> mind boggling. No, and and I think. Well, oh, see, you're drawing me into this conversation. I do not want to get involved with this conversation because it just <laughs> infuriates me. I think, in my opinion, people and the, you know the media, people, music fans, anyone that has a pulse right now that follows music knows to expect this kind of crazy from Courtney Love. So people know that when she's you know anything is going on in her life, she's going to be writing crazy things on her MySpace, on her Facebook, you know doing these crazy interviews, you know... Especially now. I mean, this is good publicity for her. Hey, don't forget about me. I've got an album out. 
Yeah, never mind the fact that she's lost custody of her child. Never mind the fact that she's been publicly, you know, uh, outed for some drug related issues in the last few years. You know, she's she's crazy and she's not afraid to debase her own reputation by just, you know, running garbage out her mouth. And so Billy, I think, in this instance, is sort of up against a wall because she's making these public accusations or public, um, you know, statements that are offensive to his work ethic and to his, you know, actual songwriting ability or trying to take credit for things he did. And he's made it very clear in the past that he's not spe- he's not on speaking terms with her anymore. So if I was in his place, too, I'd feel like I had to do some sort of self-defending. Um, and what outlet do you have besides, you know, you don't want to make a huge deal out of it. Like, what what's he going to do? Call Howard Stern and demand to come on and set the record straight? Because that's then you're Billy making, like... The time. Well, <laughs> <laughs> this whole thing is what Billy does all the time. I mean, to me, they're the same person, basically. Courtney and Billy, like, do, she's doing the exact same thing he does, like, basically. and she But she's doing it to him. And so a lot of people should probably, you know, be amused by, you know, Billy being attacked publicly and then feeling he has to respond because that's the same thing Billy does in ton he calls up Rolling Stone he does this interview he tell he says some bad things about Jimmy then Jimmy gets the call from the Rolling Stone like Billy says this what do you say and then Jimmy gets mad you know and that it's was around childish. the time that, and that's that's around the time that Billy has Tear Garden coming out I mean that's what they do I yeah. mean that's they've become famous I, I I just see them as like there's what the, the whole Courtney coming back into the media over the last few months has really made me realize how very similar they are, and in some ways that, you know, <laughs> lends some understanding maybe to why they uh, have been together in the past. <laughs> you know, that they're so... that their approach to the media and their approach to um, stardom and, and making music has been so similar. Uh, so, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't have a, a... I'm actually not really down on either of them so much. I mean... Maybe you are a little more Jill, but I mean, it's certainly... It's just a drag to have to read about this crap. It's so such a non... I mean, it's just... It's a non-issue to me. Billy Corgan wrote some songs. Courtney's trying to take credit for them. Then she dredges out... And, and, and it's also like there are these other innocent bystanders that are just getting, you know, bashed around. Like poor Gavin Rossdale. Like, and Gwen Stefani. You know, they have kids... And, you know, Courtney's coming out and making these allegations that, oh, we slept together while you guys were married. And it's just like, yeah. what? Where does it? She just has no off button. It's just no tact. I just would think that all these years of Billy saying things publicly about James and James always responding with, like, no comment or I'm going to choose to remember the good things about the past or whatever, you'd think Billy would see that, hey, like, people sympathize with James when James does that. Maybe I should do the same thing when I'm in that situation. I don't think Billy really cares whether people sympathize with him, though. Yeah, I I agree. Maybe that's a deep statement, but... (laughs) Not necessarily sympathize, but yeah, I would would agree at this point, I don't think he really cares what his public image is like. And... and he, I don't think playing. Courtney does either, but she, the, the way she grabs for attention, I think she truly does. I mean, this I was mean, pure baiting on her part. I'm sure she yeah. knew that she would, like, say some of these inflammatory things and that Billy would get involved and then there would be lots and lots of reporting about it and she's I, I wanna, back in the news again. Yeah. I want to qualify what I said, though. I think he cares, but sometimes other things matter more and he's, like, willing to sacrifice it, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, like he's willing to sacrifice people thinking nice things about him in order to, you know, make a point or get his music more attention. You know, I mean, I absolutely think, but so I don't want to make it sound like he's just oblivious to people's views of him. Cause I don't think that's true. Um, but he's definitely willing to make that trade off like a lot. Like <laughs> he's willing to give up people thinking well of him for other goals. Yeah. Yeah, it really seems like he has a need, especially in the last 
five or six years to set the record straight about everything, starting well, with his confessions where he first started saying that you know James is the reason the band broke up. It seems like he kind of has thrown down the gauntlet and said, you know, I'm not going to stick up for other people anymore when I think they've done something wrong, and I'm not going to sit here and let other people blame me for things that I don't think that I was responsible for. Let justice be done, though the heavens fall. Isn't that some sort of Christian maxim? Sorry, I'm no expert. I was hoping (laughs) someone else would validate that comment. Well, in more music-related news, Billy was interviewed on UltimateGuitar.com about topics ranging from his record label to upcoming Tear Garden tracks, and some of it was old news since they, they sent... It sounds like they sent email questions to Billy a couple of months ago, although his responses did seem like they were more recent. But while Billy wouldn't reveal the titles of any of the next four Tear Garden tracks to be released, he did say that they are, quote, better than the previous four. And, I mean, I wouldn't expect Billy to tell us that the songs are going to be worse than the previous four, but, Andrew, do you think it's strange that he's kind of dismissing songs that are on an EP that's not... It's going on sale in a few weeks, it hasn't come out yet, and he's already saying that they're, what's coming out is subpar to what's coming up in the near future. Yeah, well, it's, it's a bit odd to undercut the, the current product, so to speak. I think possibly Billy could just be being brutally honest and completely open with how he feels about that maybe he feels like now that he's sort of four songs into the process, maybe he's got a better idea of what of where the the project as a whole is going, and so that these next four songs are going to be better informed because of that. You know, it's um, it's a little strange because you know he's this is sort of a whole new way of for him to release music. So it's, we've we've never he's he's never had the this sort of situation has never come up before where you, you know he didn't have like he didn't make three songs out of Siamese or even say oh well. This next three songs that I'm going to do next are going to be even better. In fact, those other three songs are awful. <laughs> but, you know, so it possibly, you know, he's just being a little bit more, possibly, you know, he's, he's letting us into his own mind a bit more than maybe he should. But, you know, if the idea is to get people back, maybe he's trying to win back some, or win back some listens from people who, listened to the first couple of songs and and went away to yeah. say maybe oh well maybe I'll check in the next couple and see if uh, I like these new songs any better and yeah sort of a way to get 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 find get some people back who sort of have uh, lost interest in the in the project I totally think that's what it is I mean he's been doing this since Juan basically yeah you know? um I mean the most notable time he did it was the day he released uh, the future embrace, you know, he announces that he's going to reform the pumpkins. You know? <laughs> um, <laughs> it's kind of like, and I, I, I think Andrew is spot on for the motivation that it's not really about that. He thinks these songs are bad. Um, it's that he's trying to, he's just trying to say, yeah, well, nobody's listening to those. So how do I get him to listen to the next ones? Tell him the next ones are going to be better. You know, <laughs> Uh, I, and I don't really think he believes that. I think, you know, I think he would look back and think the last decade of his work is pretty good. I think it's pretty good. Yeah, but I, I think it's, I, th- I don't think it's as um, negative as you all are sort of implying. I think that he genuinely probably thinks that the next stuff coming up is, is going to be great because he's really excited about this project. I mean, anyone that is practicing their art form Mm-hmm. as much as they, you know, as much as the pumpkins are right now, as much as Billy is, you know, he's in that mode of creation. And so when you sort of start, you know, finding that thread that you kind of like pull yourself along as part of an artistic project, I think that it's natural to be like, yeah, this is going to be, you know, this song's going to be better. This song's going to be better. This, you know, you, you get more into the actual editorial perspective of your work. And so I think that he probably really thinks that it's going to be better, and it probably is because it's probably going to be more cohesive to whatever central theme that he's exploring for himself. I mean, I feel this way in my photography, and you know, I'm not professional by any means, but you know, the more the more I practice and the more I do, you know, active work, 
the better I feel about what's coming up next because my toolbox or, you know, my set of skills um, is getting better and better. And then he, I mean, they've been taking some time off for a while too, so. Yeah, I think there's something to that. I mean, I certainly prefer an art, you know, an artist who's forward looking, uh, you know, thinking about how the next stuff is going to be better and, and trying to sell you the stuff he hasn't done versus artists trying to sell you the stuff they've already done. Like mm-hmm. today, just looking through our Twitter feed, I saw Adam Lambert like exhorting his followers to help him get his old his new single on the radio. Well, they've already had his new single. His followers have probably already listened to it a million times. Like it was on his album, which has been out for several months. You know, I mean, how excited is it from a fan's standpoint to have? If Billy was saying, "Come on, guys, help me get Widow Wake My Mind on the radio," like if that's where his mind was right now, like boring, put me to sleep. You know, mm-hmm. but the idea that where he what he's thinking about and what he's talking about is the songs he's gonna write. I mean, that to me is right. much more engaging. Well, and it's not necessarily the songs he's gonna write; it's the songs that he's working on right now. I mean, he's releasing these songs on a it's a sliding window. You know, like he released Astral Planes very recently to us, but he worked on Astral Planes back in October. Like that was the first song yeah. that they were they recorded and mixed. And he even says in this interview. Um, the question is, are these ideas you've been working on or is everything new? And his response is, quote, almost everything is post guys period, but I'm finding as I go along that I'm less interested in the stuff I've already written. I'm seeing a whole new road to go down now musically and emotionally, and it involves a lot of guitars. Yeah, that kind of sounds like marketing. (laughs) It does, but it does. I mean, I think it's natural to be more excited by what you can potentially see in the future as opposed to what you've already done. The lot of guitars part sounds like marketing, but the I'm not excited about the things that I was thinking about writing for this album a few months ago, I'm more excited about stuff I'm writing right now, sounds like pure Billy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's what I was thinking too. I'm like, this is just Billy Corgan talking. Like, that's how he's always been. Like, this one thing, you know, he creates this new band, they come out for their show, their first shows in late 2001, and they play this full set of all new material. And then by the time their album comes out in early 2003, like two of those songs made the album or something, you know? Yeah. Right. So, I mean, that's how he's operated for a long time now. Even going back to the very earliest days of the band, back in 1988, 89, they were constantly rotating new songs in. And I, I think that's pretty rare for a a band just starting up. A lot of times, at least when I would go see local bands in St. Louis, the bands would always be performing the same songs, the ones they thought were the strongest, just to try to get more and more people to hear them. And they were really like all about, well, we wrote this song and we think it's good. We're just going to keep playing it till people agree. <laughs> Where Billy's always been, up, oh, got to do something new. I, I think I can do this better. I think I can do this better. Yeah. Slash. People didn't like that one. I can do a, <laughs> I can do one they'll like. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. But... I, like when this project first started, I, I was thinking like, "Oh, this is perfect for Billy because he is like that." But it's almost worse because he like I don't think he can do it fast enough. You know, it really seems like it's he's like getting a- ahead of himself. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, he's gonna have when he when he when he gets to the end of Tear Garden, he's gonna throw it every. <laughs> he's gonna rip three hundred songs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the final, you know, the, the final box set's going to have 400 or, you know, 50 new songs that have never been released before. <laughs> yeah, releasing one song a month is, isn't enough. Yeah, they'll write 15 songs for the second EP that'll have <laughs> songs. Well, thanks for joining us this week. Our closing song is Widow Wake My Mind from The Tonight Show on April 20th, 2010. Good night, everybody.
United Podcast is not affiliated with or endorsed by the Smashing Pumpkins, Virgin Records, or Warner Brothers Reprise Records. All opinions offered by panelists or guests of the Hipsters United Podcast are their own and do not represent the opinions of the Smashing Pumpkins. All audio during the show is licensed for non-profit use per the terms and conditions on the Live Music Archive at archive.org. Intro music is from the Machina 2 album released for free download on the internet by the Smashing Pumpkins in September of 2000.